Welcome to Nature's Guardians. I'm Micah Siegel. Each week, I talk with people working to save and help animals around the world. They are nature's guardians, and you can become one too. Today, I'm welcoming my, first, my very first guest to the Nature's Guardians studios in downtown Bethesda, Maryland. I'm excited to be talking face-to-face -face with Barney Long from Rewild. Welcome to Bethesda, Barney. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Micah. Great to have you. So you're working on so many things. What are you working on right now most? At Rewild, we work on a whole array of species, um, from Sumatran rhinos in Indonesia, all the way through to small fish in Mexico, um, and everything in between. Um, probably the project that takes up most of my time is that Sumatran rhino. Um, we've been supporting the government of Indonesia with their Sumatran rhino program for multiple years, and it's a species that's really, really near and dear to my heart. Tell us more. Most people have never even heard of the Sumatran rhino. They might have heard of black rhinos and white rhinos in Africa, um, but there's actually three species of rhino in Asia as well. Um, the greater one-horned that lives in India and Nepal and Bhutan, mm -hmm. and then the Sumatran rhino and the Javan rhino are now only found in Indonesia, even though they used to be found over a large part of Asia. Mm -hmm. And so the Sumatran rhino um, is down to very, very few individuals, probably less than 80. Um, uh, but we do have a plan to save it and recover it. And so that's what I'm working on a lot of my time at the moment. Again, tell us more. <laughs> what, what are you working on? Well, you know, initially the Sumatran rhino probably went extinct over much of its range due to habitat loss. All of the nice lowland forests got converted to cities and mm -hmm rice paddy fields and things like that. Um, that combined with poaching for its horn um, over the last 2000 years um, has slowly eaten away and populations have slowly blinked out all over Asia. Now you're left with a few left still in Indonesia. Um, and so we're working on a two prong strategy to save them. One is protect them in the wild. There's one population left. Um, which is um, still in the wild and um, still breeding. And so we're working uh, with our local partners there, um, the government of Indonesia and Forum Conservasi Lusa, um, to protect that population in the wild. Then all the others, there's still some isolated individuals dotted around that are not meeting, meeting each other. And so they can't meet and have babies. And so we're working to find those animals and bring them into a conservation breeding program. You might have heard just um, last week there was a new baby born at a breeding center in southern Sumatra. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the breeding program. But we're trying to establish another center elsewhere, um, still in Indonesia, and trying to bring all of these isolated rhinos together so that we can have a much larger breeding program. And from there, hopefully, have lots of babies and eventually start putting them back into the wild. And actually, we just had a, the last calf born two weeks ago, one week ago, um, was a male. So can you give us some specifics and details of what you do? The program is run on the ground by the government of Indonesia and our local partners there. Um, from Kosovasi Luza, Yabi, which is the Indonesian Rhino Foundation, Alert, which is another local organization, and um, the Bogor University. Um, so those are the organizations on the ground doing the work. Um, my role um, is to coordinate all of the international partners um, as well as create those connections between the organizations in Indonesia and the global community and to try and raise awareness of the species, try and bring in the funding so that those local groups on the ground um, can do all the, the really hard work. They're the, they're the stars of the show. Have any numbers, I guess? Well, it's hard to know exactly how many are left because they live in really mountainous, dense rainforests. and. The one place where we know there's a wild population can take up to two weeks to walk into the middle of that area. Um, so we don't know exactly how many are there, um, but it's not very many. Um, somewhere between 30 and 80. Um, and we really don't know within that range. Um, we do know of a handful that we're trying to catch, which are isolated individuals that are not breeding. Um, we know of at least five there's probably two or three more. Um, and then in the breeding program, we have one breeding center at the moment with 10 individuals and another breeding center with at the moment just one. 
uh, individual. Um, so you're talking less than 100, probably less than 80, um, possibly even much less than that. So really not in a good situation. The white rhino is an example of rhino that has a poaching problem. Mm -hmm. Does the Sumatran rhino have a poaching problem? Every rhino has a poaching problem, unfortunately. All five species do. Um, it's uh, poaching of Sumatran rhinos is much rarer, um, but that's only because they're so hard to find. Um, I think if they were easy to find, um, there would be more poaching. Um, the rainforests of Indonesia are huge, they're very dense, they're very mountainous, so it's really hard to find a rhino walking around in a big forest. Um, but yeah, I think rhinos are probably, Sumatran rhinos are probably where they are primarily because of poaching over the last um, hundred years. Um, obviously there's 2,000 years of incremental reductions, um, but those final extinctions of subpopulations around Asia due to poaching and small population biology. Yeah, so tell us about their biology and behavior. Like most rhinos, they're pretty solitary. Um, they do have social interactions, but they're effectively solitary. Um, the one really interesting fact I think about Sumatran rhinos is that they're hairy and they're actually more closely related to all the extinct woolly rhinos than the other four species of rhinos we have today. So they're a completely unique rhino um, and they represent millions of years of evolution. Um, they also sing, um, not Christmas songs, um, but they do sing. Uh, they have a really nice little whistle. Um, so sometimes they're called the, the singing rhino. They're a browser. Um, so they like to nip uh, leaves off shrubs and bushes. Um, they like to twist twigs um, so that other rhinos know where they've been. So they'll rub and they'll twist and they'll sing all of these little ways that you can communicate in the forest um, when you're very unlikely to actually meet another rhino. Do you ever see one in person? So I have been very lucky to see them in the breeding program, um, which is in the rainforest and it's natural enclosures. Um, it's not like a, it's, it's not like a zoo type enclosure. It's, it's natural habitat. Um, I unfortunately have never seen one in the wild. Um, I've seen the other four species of rhino in the wild. Um, but I'm yet to see the Sumatran. What do they use their horns for? Because they're not that big horns. They're very small horns and they're used for a whole range of different things. Traditionally, rhino horn was used um, to treat um, rheumatoid arthritis and, and fever, things like this. Um, but there's, there's no real proof that that works. The, the surge in poaching that started about 15 years ago was driven by um, demand in Vietnam and that was actually caused by what we think was one individual person saying that they were their cancer was cured by rhino horn and so there was a whole big demand for rhino horn as a cancer cure and that's what was driving the really big spike in poaching that happened 10-15 years ago. Um, then kind of became a status symbol in Vietnam and people started using it as a hangover cure. Um, worst idea ever, let's drive a species extinct for a hangover cure. Um, but that has been what's been driving the recent um, demand. Um, so demand kind of changes over time, um, just like it does for any product, different people wanting it for different reasons. Um, but really, a rhino horn is definitely more useful on the front of a rhino's head. What can you tell us about Javan rhinos? Well, Javan rhinos, similar to Sumatran rhinos, are only found in Indonesia. They're actually now restricted to a single location in Indonesia, uh, on the island of Java, although they are very closely related to the greater one-horned rhino, or the Indian rhino. Um, so they're what we call sister species. So it used to live across most of Southeast Asia. Um, and over the last 2,000 years has been reduced to a single location. And that single location probably would not have rhinos if it wasn't for a volcano exploding. There's a massive volcano called Krakatau, um, which is only 50 miles 
away from where these rhinos live. And there was a massive explosion. I can't remember the exact date, 1867 or something. Um, and it actually caused the whole world to go dark for two years. Um, so there was that much ash in the atmosphere. And sailors report having tsunamis thousands of miles away. Um, people heard it hundreds of miles away. It was a massive, massive explosion. And that wiped everything out of northern Java where the rhinos now live. And what happened was no one went back there because everyone was scared. And so this area recovered and the rhinos lived there safely. And whilst they were being losing all their habitat and being poached everywhere else, they managed to stay in this one area really close to the volcano. Um, and so the Indonesian government um, established it as a park and there was uh, anti-poaching units established. And um, from about the 1960s onwards, there has been no poaching of this rhino because of the good protection that's been put in place. Um, unfortunately, the size of the park means we can't have any more rhinos there. It's full, <laughs> which is a good thing. But it means that they they will never increase to more than 75, 80 individuals as long as they stay in this park. Um, so we need to move some to another location to start another population. Is that being done? Are you doing that? And where? It's something I've been wanting to do um, for a long, long time. Unfortunately, um, it's going to take a huge amount of money to find another location, secure it, and move the rhinos. It's something that's been talked about for decades and not happened. And so it's, it's definitely something we need to move forward uh, in the coming years. How much do you need? Somewhere between 10 and 20 million is what we need um, to properly protect the rhinos where they are, to establish a second location and to move some. I have no idea how to get that. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. Give us like 15 years. And... <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> So what does Rewild do? Rewild's mission is to save the planet, to support um, all the wildlife on the planet to recover. Um, we do that through working with and supporting local organizations. Um, so when we go to a country, we don't go there and set up a new office and hire a load of staff. We go there and we find all the really good local conservation organizations there. And we ask them what their priorities are and what they're interested in and what they help they need. And then we do as much as we can to help them to do conservation bigger and better. Um, so we do a lot of establishing new protected areas, whether that's government or community or indigenous land. Um, and then we do a lot with species, trying to uh, protect species and recover them. And we tend to focus on species that other organizations are not working on. So yes, we do work on rhinos. That's one of my favorite species and projects. Um, but we generally work on species that are smaller and more forgotten. So we have a species, uh, a whole program on amphibians a whole program on freshwater fish. Um, we even have a program called Lost Species, which is looking for species that have not been seen for 10 years. I'm really interested in the amphibians part because I've never heard of this. What's that about? Well, you know, amphibians are really important because they're almost like the world's thermometer. We just finished um, assessing all amphibians in the world. Um, we looked at over 8,000 species and looked at how close to going extinct they are. And from that, we created a blueprint to look at where the most important places are to save amphibians, both at the site level and the landscape level, and also which types of amphibian are most threatened with extinction. And what we're doing now is trying to work with the whole global community of amphibian conservationists to figure out how we can scale up conservation for amphibians. Um, they're the most threatened group of vertebrates um, with, uh, I think it's, I should know this, 46% are threatened with extinction. I think I've got that right. Um, and so we really need a lot of effort to protect amphibians. And we know we can save them um, with the right 
coalitions of organizations, the dedicated individuals and the right funding, um, we can save amphibians. We just need people to care about them and to focus on them. So pick a couple of species and tell us how you help them. Sure. Um, well, I'll start with the most famous amphibian on the planet, apart from Kermit. Um, have you heard of Romeo the frog? No. So Romeo the frog is a species called the sequentious water frog. It lives in Bolivia. And a few years ago, it was only known from a single individual male uh, in, a, in a museum in Bolivia. So we embarked on a search to find Romeo a girlfriend. Um, and we actually worked with Match.com on this at Valentine's Day. And we gave Romeo a profile and through that we managed to raise some money to do some expeditions and we managed to find him Juliet. Um, so through that program we actually ended up finding a few individuals and we now have six or seven animals in the museum as part of a breeding program. And hopefully those will be um, successful in breeding and create a whole new generation. Um, of uh, sequentious water frogs that we will eventually be able to put back into the wild. Yeah, that's a great project. Yep. That yeah. response was AI generated. <laughs> so, do you help any fish species? One thing that I'm very proud of is that we work on species no matter how big or small, how colorful or not colorful they are. Um, one project that we've helped with through a coalition that we're involved in called Shoal which is a global coalition to um, save freshwater species from extinction. And one project that they've been engaged in is with the La, Pe La Paz split fin. This is a small little gray fish in Mexico, um, which there's a whole suite of species called goudiads. Um, they're all small little gray fish in Mexico. Some have nice little yellow highlights uh, and things like that. Um, but they're all very threatened with extinction. They're all found in small little lakes or tiny little streams, um, and due to pollution and invasive species and other reasons, they're disappearing. Many of them are now only found in, in captivity, under human care, they're no longer in the wild. And that was the case for this La Paz split fin. Um, but thankfully, uh, Chester Zoo and some organizations in, in Mexico had been breeding it for a long time. And uh, I think it was last year or during Day of the Dead, which is a really big Mexican festival that celebrates the dead. Um, these fish were reintroduced. And the reason why it was Day of the Dead is that we're reintroducing an extinct in the wild species back to the wild. And it was a really great cultural connection between something that is dead, <laughs> but has come back to life. Um, like these lakes have been restored and the lakes are coming back to life and the fish are coming back. So tell us more about Rewild, the organization you're in. Like how many staff they have and how much money they have. Well, Rewild, um, there's about 70 staff, I think. Um, we're quite small in terms of how many people we have. But because we work through local partners um, and all the money we raise goes to local partners um, that we're able to keep quite small and make sure all of the funding that we raise goes to uh, our local conservation partners in country. Um, and so we're more of a fundraising capacity building organization. So we started around 15 years ago as global wildlife conservation. Um, but about two, three years ago, uh, we merged with the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation and became Rewild. Um, and so we've only been Rewild uh, for a short period of time, um, but we've been going from strength to strength over the last few years, um, really growing rapidly. Um, I joined Rewild eight years ago and there was only seven people then. <laughs> um, so we've grown very quickly in the last few years. So besides money, what do you bring to these local groups, for their projects? That's a really good question. Um, hopefully the answer is whatever they need, but you'd have to ask them. Um, so we bring many things. One thing is capacity. Um, we we co-create projects with our local partners so we can bring strategic advice. Um, 
technical advice, we can deploy people to help with very specific things, whether it's how to create a national park management plan or a species recovery plan, or whether they need training in camera trap design, um, many, many things. The other thing we're able to do is really give a voice to projects globally. A great example of this is the silverback chevrotain, which is a small deer in Vietnam. And we worked with a student to, to look for this. Gave him a very small grant to do some interviews with local communities. He found an area that he thought maybe there was some chevrotain in, so we gave him another small grant to get some camera traps and put some camera traps in there. He found the species. We were able to check that with the world experts. Um, and then we put that in the newspapers and online, and it got so much publicity that he was then able to fundraise. And he's now doing a master's on this species in Germany. Um, he's discovered uh, five populations now. We have anti-poaching operations going on in one of these. Um, they just did a big national workshop on the species. Um, so it's now got all of this momentum and that one student is now, he's gonna work on this species for the rest of his life. Um, and we were able to really launch his career by providing small funding, yes, but really it was the connections and the publicity. Um, at a much larger scale, the other thing we do um, is we convene. Um, because when we are fundraising, we're fundraising for our partners, not for us. It means that if we are fundraising for our Chevrotain project, 100% of the money we raise for Chevrotain go to our local partners. That means we are a trusted facilitator um, for conversations. A great example of that is the Atalopus Survival Initiative. Uh, Atalopus is a genus of frogs called the Harlequin Toads. Um, we were able to facilitate all of the people working on Harlequin Toads to come together to develop an action plan, develop the Atalopus Survival Initiative and really fundraise at scale and scale that impact to work on 99 species of Harlequin Toads. Um, so that was a really good way that as a neutral facilitator, we're able to come in and try and get to scale. And you can take that even larger when you start looking at the donors. Often the donors want to fund small groups but small groups don't know how to get hold of big donors. They don't know how to manage big grants. So what we often do is create coalitions of donors that can give large money and then we can give, we'll take, pull all of that money into one fund and then we can give that to hundreds of small local partners and manage that on behalf of other donors because we have the technical expertise and the knowledge of all of those partners. And that way we're really able to scale impact across entire regions. In the time we have left, let's just quickly solve poaching. I'd love to solve the poaching crisis. <laughs> um, it's, when you talk about poaching though, I think most people when they think about poaching, their head automatically goes to elephants and rhinos and tigers, maybe pangolins. Um, but poaching goes far beyond that. Um, you can look at species all over the world that are impacted by poaching. Um, and poaching is driven by so many different needs and issues as well. Um, and so it's really hard to unpack poaching as one thing. Um, poaching is just hunting where it's not allowed. And so it can be, poaching can be for subsistence use. And maybe that should not be called poaching because people need to do that to survive. So there's a very delicate conversation to be had around what is poaching and what is not when it comes to local and indigenous communities. Um, but when you get into things like ivory trade, which is organized um, professional poaching and criminal organizations, that's a very different issue. And I think you need to look at the continuum between indigenous subsistence hunting in the wrong area <laughs> all the way through to organized criminal syndicates. Um, and there is everything in between. Um, there are people going into small island nations, identifying undescribed gecko species, collecting all of them and taking them to another country, describing them and then selling them 
once everyone knows this species exists. Um, that's extremely organized, but it's often an individual doing it. Um, and those species, because they're not described, are not protected by law. So they're not doing anything illegal, but it's still poaching. <laughs> um, and they are driving species to extinction for the pet trade because no one is paying attention to that kind of poaching. And so what do you call poaching? Fishing in the wrong place is poaching. Um, so tell me a little bit more about poaching from your point of view. So instantly what I think of is like one of those like mammal, big, decently sized animals, some dude with a sniper rifle, just blows its head out and then gets it, cuts off the horn, maybe cuts off the head to put on a wall or something, I don't know, right? And then goes, ships it off, sells it or something, does whatever with it. Yep. And I can, I can see that with fishing too. Um, poaching for me, I, I've always thought of is killing the animal right then and there, right? Yeah, but it's not necessarily. I think taking a live animal out of an area without permission is still poaching. And whether that's a fish for the aquaria trade, a gecko for the pet trade, uh, a parrot for the pet trade, um, or whether it's people illegally catching snakes for fashion houses um, to make handbags or shoes out of. Um, if it's... Guilty. <laughs> if it's not legal and it's not permitted it's officially poaching and as i say some of this is happening and it's not poaching because it's not illegal because these species are not protected by law um, but it's still a use that is not really needed by us none of us need to have a snake skin belt um, and so do we really need to be taking these species out of the wild, whether it's permitted or not permitted? How can we reduce the demand for those things? Yeah, that's the, uh, the one million species question. <laughs> um, it's difficult. Um, and I think, again, people often pigeonhole that demand as coming from places like China and Vietnam. And yes, there is demand in China and Vietnam for certain products. Um, but when you look at the pet trade, for example, the demand is coming from Europe and America. Um, so there's different demands in different places of the world for different products. And so depending on the product and where you are in the world, you need to think about what that demand is for and think about how you can market that demand so it goes away. Marketing is not a skill that I have. <laughs> um, but when you think about diamonds, for example, everyone now when they get engaged buys their fiance, hopefully future wife, uh, a diamond ring. That was not the case 100 years ago. It was one company that uh, decided. It was exactly 100 years ago. Was it 100 years ago this year? Yeah. Okay. Maybe 99 years ago. Okay. Anyway. So it was that one company that decided this is a great way to get us having a sale of diamonds all the time if every engagement ring has to have a diamond in it. And so they came up with the idea of diamond engagement rings, diamonds as a girl's best friend, and it became culture that that is what you do. So marketing got us into that. How do we get marketing to get us out of something like that? And that's what we need to do. We need to be able to change the perception and the demand for these products. Um, and I do believe it can be done. It might take a long time, but we need to think about how we do this. Um, and I think conservationists are not necessarily the best people to do this. Marketers are, social media experts are, um, just like yourself. Um, and how do we do this? And I think one of the other things to think about is who will the people buying these products listen to. If it's a demand that is luxury driven, then they're only going to listen to certain people. If it's a demand driven by young people 
they're only going to listen to certain people. And those two groups won't listen to the same person. So how you've got to market also to the exact demographic that is buying the product. There's no point saying the demand for rhino horn in Vietnam is crazy big, so we must change the attitude of all Vietnamese. Most Vietnamese don't use rhino horn. It's a very small percentage of them. So how do you get to them giving the right message to the right person from the right person so that they will change their mind? Um, and that's very difficult because every product has multiple people, types of people buying it for multiple different reasons. You know, this reminds me of, what was that movie? There, there's two, The Great Big Hack. <laughs> and The Great Hack, yeah. And, and what was the other one? I, mean, I forget. Social Dilemma. Where, it's, where they social change dilemma. people's minds on like voting and, and that elections and stuff just through marketing, targeting specific people like you're talking about with these rhino horns. Absolutely. So in Asia, it's a status symbol to eat shark fin soup with friends or have a rhino horn carving on your wall or something. Um, so how can we reduce the demand for those things? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. With, with development and people getting richer, they can afford more things. Um, same in every country. Um, and. I think for me, it's actually quite positive that these things are more of a status symbol because status symbols change over time. The young generations all over the world, but especially in, in Asia, the young are so much more environmentally aware and conscious um, than the previous generations before them. And the next generation after them will become even more environmentally aware. And so to me, the youth is actually the key demographic we need to change. If you make it yucky for someone to have a lizard belt or a piece of rhino horn, then A, they can pressure their parents, and B, they won't use it. And when they get older and influential, they'll tell everyone else not to use it. So you think the de stopping the demand for these items will save the animals instead of stopping the supply? Um, the demand, stopping the demand is the ultimate solution, uh, which will allow these species to recover in the wild. Um, if we wait for demand to stop, lots of these species will go extinct. So you have to work on protecting them in the wild at the same time as reducing the demand. And eventually, if there's no demand, you won't need all the in situ, in the field protections. You'll still need some, but it won't be as intense. So they need to go hand in hand and hopefully over time you'll be able to stop working on both because there'll be no demand and therefore there'll be much less need for, for really big operations on the ground in terms of protection. So I would really like to work with Rewild on what we've been talking about, this targeting the people who are targeting, targeting is a little aggressive, but finding the people who are buying these products and convincing them and making it yucky to have a, a ginormous rhino horn sculpture and eat shark fin soup, right? I, so would that be a possibility? Yeah, highly potentially it could be. I, I think what you're doing is amazing because you are out there on the internet engaging with, I don't know the demographic of people that listen to you, but I'm presuming a similar age, that new generation coming up that need to understand what's going on with the planet and the species that we share this planet with. I think it would be amazing if you could start reaching out to other people in other countries doing a similar thing in their own language for their own community and start forming a network of kids speaking to kids across the world talking about demand, talking about how what you buy in the grocery store or what you buy online really makes a difference. And when you start growing that network, maybe you can bring in some Vietnamese, some Chinese, um, local celebrities, internet stars that can start talking about that. Um, I think that would be really powerful to find that network. Um, and maybe, you know, in the next five years, try and get one person in every single country that will join in with you to do exactly what you're doing for the English-speaking audience of the US.
that's a lot. That would be like 300 something people, but I, I can try. That's how revolutions start. One person having an idea. Thanks for the idea. I, thank you. This is, let's wrap it up. So, <laughs> so give me a realistic prediction for these species for the next 30 years. That's a really tough question. Um, I think that the big charismatic species will survive. And as human population starts to stabilize, hopefully start to decrease at some point, um, and probably become a lot more urban with bigger mega cities and less people working out in rural areas, we'll start to get a little bit more wilderness back and the bigger charismatic species will start to recover because that environmental consciousness of people being in cities, being richer, having more time to become more educated and understand the impact of their purchasing power. I'm quite optimistic that humans will start taking pressure off the world at some point in the coming couple of decades. Having said that, the non-charismatic species that most people don't know about, forget about, um, their big issue is often habitat loss or even if it's poaching, it's poaching and no one's caring about it because no one's looking after those species, they don't even know about those species. We are going to lose a lot of smaller species because of neglect by the human race. Just people not focusing on them and little bits of habitat being eroded around the edges um, and a few really selfish people taking them out of the wild to sell for whatever reason. So I think we will lose some proportion of biodiversity, but I do think in the next 30, 40, 50 years, we'll start to rewild the planet and we will get more and more wilderness back. And if we can save everything for the next 10, 20 years, those species will have a chance to recover in the future. So it's about holding the line right now so that we can start taking the pressure off and giving the earth back what it needs. Thank you for coming here to talk with me, Barney. And thank you for watching. You can help animals by hitting the like button and subscribing to this channel. I'll see you next time on Nature's Guardians. Bye. Excellent Great. job. Great. Thank you. Awesome. I was, like, Fantastic. I want to say this off camera, that was really good. <laughs>